Let me take this moment to welcome all of you here and those of you that are watching online to Venia Church. Venia means grace, and here at Venia we share God's grace by loving people because God accepts us as we are and sees the potential of who we can be. Amen? Amen. God's Word changes lives. So this morning we're going to be in the book of Daniel chapter 11. Uh, and I want to talk to you this morning about the repetition that can be found in God's Word. Uh, God's Word can be very, and I may even use the word extremely, repetitive. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the idea of being holy. God tells us to be holy. Why? Because He is holy. And this is a topic that you will hear, a concept in God's Word, over and over and over again. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we are to be holy. In other words, set ourselves aside. Our life is to be set apart from everything else so that way our life can be used for God and his glory. That's what being holy is. God tells us over and over again that we are to be holy and it can almost appear to be repetitive in a way we're like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm supposed to be holy. But what God's trying to do is make sure that we get his emphasis. And so the use of repetition in the Bible is usually emphasizing the importance of the thing that's being repeated, whether it be a person or a theme or an event. God is trying to drill it into our minds. And so he's going over it and over it and over it. And it can be a very, very powerful tool. Um, advertisers use this tool all the time. Uh, EA Sports. It's in the game, right? I mean, everybody knows EA Sports. It's in the game. Or McDonald's. I'm loving it, right? Skittles. Taste the rainbow. Nike. Just do it. All right, now let's see who was growing up in the 80s. Plop. Plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. Alka-Seltzer, there you go. <laughs> Wendy's, where's the beef? How about this? Clap on, clap off, clap on, clap off, the clapper, right? I mean, it's just this repetitive thing. The more you hear it, the more it sinks in. It sinks into the point where... You haven't seen that old lady walk into a Wendy's in probably 30 years now. But you remember that little old lady. Where's the beef? I mean, it's just ingrained into our minds to the point where we know it. Uh, you can see how well repetition works. And that's why God uses it in his word. And every bit of God's word, whether it seems repetitive or not, every single portion of it is important. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us this, that all scripture, in other words, every bit of God's word is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people. Why? To do every good work. God has things that he wants us to accomplish in this life for him. And so he ingrains these truths in our lives over and over and over again until it becomes a part of who we are. So that way we're equipped to do everything that God has called you and I to do. Uh, and so what repetition do we find in our text today? Well, we're going to experience that together as we go through this message entitled Repetition as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Daniel. Now, if you're just joining us this morning, welcome. We're glad you guys are here. Uh, we are in the second half of the book of Daniel. Here in the second half, we've already seen the visions of the four uh, beasts. We've seen the vision of the ram and the goat. Uh, the, we've seen Daniel's prayer of repentance as God is uh, preparing to give him a vision. And then we saw the vision of the 70 weeks, also known as the 70 weeks of Daniel. Uh, last week when we got together, we saw that Daniel's going through a tremendous amount of spiritual warfare. Uh, and as he's going through the spiritual warfare, Jesus and an angel shows up and is there to minister to Daniel. And um, God will be there for you as well. And so if you missed that message, go to venia.tv forward slash sermons and you can check any of those out. Uh, but today, as we discuss the repetition that's found 
in God's word, I was reminded of repetition in my own life, things that have gone on and over and over. And and I was thinking about a video that my son and I were watching online. It was this video of this kid that kept telling his dad how much he loved him. Check this video out. Bow daddy kiss. Stay right here, Colton. Colton, wait. Colton, come here. I love that. That that goes on for two and a half minutes. He, the dad's driving down the road, and the kids say, I love you, dad. And the dad's just yelling out of the truck, I love you too, son. Just kept going back and forth. And my son and I were cracking up at that because that is us. That's always been me and my son. And even to this day, I mean, it's going to be 20 in a couple months, you know. And we'll call, and we're talking on the phone. And we're all right, love you, son. Love you too, dad. Love you. All right, son, bye. All right, love you. Love you. And we'll say it over, we'll probably say it 10 or 15 times before we actually hang up the phone. And I'm not joking. This is like every single time we talk. It's just this repetitive thing. We're constantly telling over and over and over again how much we love each other. Do I get sick of that repetition? You better believe I don't. I love hearing my son tell me how much he loves me. And I love telling him. And I think if we were all honest with ourselves, we, we want to hear that. We want to know it, and especially when it comes from God. We want to know how much God loves us. And that's a theme that's in his word over and over and over again. And so keep this concept of repetitiveness in your mind as we open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 11. We're going to pick up in verse 1 this morning. And this is, let me just prep you for just a moment. We are going to have a major history lesson today, okay? We're going to go through a lot of stuff, and so buckle your seatbelts and let's get into it. Uh, Verse 1, chapter 11 says, Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. Now this first verse here really should go at the end of chapter 10. This is the angel that was there giving the message to uh, Daniel. It was the end of him preparing Daniel to hear the vision that's about to be given to him. Now, before you and I continue in chapter 11, let's see this vision that he's going to get. Where does this vision fit in with the 70 weeks of Daniel? Uh, And so in order to figure that out, let's just review quickly the 70 weeks of Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 tells us that 70 weeks are determined for your your people and your holy city. Uh, And so 70 weeks is actually 70, it's actually 490 years. Uh, Weeks in the Bible in the ancient Hebrew simply refers to a unit of seven, And so this is 70 sets of seven years, or what you might have heard, 70 weeks of years. Uh, And so you go seven times 70 gives you 490. Uh, So we're not going to just have a history lesson, we're going to have a math lesson as well. Uh, So seven times 70 gives you the 490 years. And then it goes on to say that, that these 70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Uh, So at the end of these 70 weeks, when all 70 weeks are completed, uh, sin itself is going to be restrained. Uh, What you'll see is that there's going to be a new order established here on earth, and that's going to be established by Jesus, the Messiah. And in that new order, mankind's rebellion against God is going to be finished. Uh, And then it goes on to say to make reconciliation for iniquity. Uh, If you are here today and you're not a person who's placed your faith in Jesus Christ, first of all, from the bottom of our family's heart, we are glad you're here or we're glad that you're watching online because there is a consequence to sin. And when I say a 
sin, what I'm talking about is God has a way of living that he wants for us. He's laid it out in his word that there's a certain way we're supposed to live our lives. Nobody does that. No Christian does that, uh, not consistently enough anyways. Um, And so if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ yet, know that we are no better than you. We are imperfect people just like you, but we serve a very perfect God. Uh, And so there's a consequence to sin. Uh, The consequence is hell. Uh, But God made a way out of that. Uh, And so where it says to make a reconciliation for iniquity, what that is referring to is when Jesus died on that cross, he was he lived a perfect life. He hung on that cross. He was buried in a tomb. And three days later, he rose again and sent his Holy Spirit to dwell within us as we believe in him. That is the way to eternity in heaven. And so that's what is referred to here. And so if you haven't given your life over to Christ, we would love to talk to you uh, after church or call into the church office. We'd love to speak to you about that. Uh, But it says to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness. That everlasting righteousness is, again, referring to the new world order, uh, this kingdom of God here on earth that will be established by the Messiah. It says to bring an everlasting righteousness to seal up vision and prophecy. Uh, what you'll find, especially we go through the message this morning, is that God speaks prophetically. He says, okay, this is what's going to happen. Now, as he spoke these things to Daniel and to various other prophets, he said, this is what's going to happen. And, and many of those things have already happened. Uh, the 69 weeks, we'll find, have come and they've gone. Uh, the 69 weeks are over. The 70th week is yet to come. And so we, as students of God's Word now, we have the privilege of not only knowing what God said will happen, but we also can look back on history and see many of these things have already taken place. Uh, and that is, again, a very repetitive theme throughout the Word of God, and we're going to dive in even deeper to that this morning. But to seal up vision and prophecy, some of it's already history, some of it's still yet to come, but there will be a point in time when all prophecy is complete. All prophecy will be history, uh, and we will be, as believers in God, will be there in heaven and knowing all of that. Now, it says to anoint the most holy. To anoint the most holy, what this is referring to is the holy of holies, the place there on the temple mount uh, where the very presence of God dwelt. Uh, That is a source of rub for many people in the world. It's a source of wars. People have been fighting over that little sliver of land for a long time. And when it's all said and done, that, uh, that place will be anointed. No longer will there be any wars about that. Now, There's a lot of information to cover over the 70 weeks of Daniel's vision. And so today we're going to focus in on the first 69 weeks of those uh, 70 weeks. And so let's take a look at what the vision says about these 69 weeks. Daniel chapter 25, I'm sorry, chapter 9, verse 25 gives us two very important time frames. It says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, to know, therefore, and understand that from, so this is the beginning point, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, which total 69 weeks, the 69 weeks we're talking about today, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now, the Bible gives us four different points that that this could start from, uh, because it says that that it's from the command to both restore and build Jerusalem. Keep in mind, Jerusalem is a city in Israel. Uh, So there's four possibilities of when this could have taken place. The decree of Cyrus in Ezra chapter 1 and Ezra chapter 5, where uh, Cyrus gave a decree that Ezra had the right to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple in 538 B.C. That most likely isn't the beginning point, and I'll tell you why. It was to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Uh, But what's clearly stated in this is that it's the command to restore and build Jerusalem, which is the city 
as a whole, not just the temple. Uh, so that most likely isn't the beginning point. Another uh, time was given by Darius, a uh, similar decree in 517 BC. We see in Ezra chapter 6 that he gave the same decree, go back, rebuild the temple. Also, Artaxerxes did the same thing in 458 BC in Ezra chapter 7. And so those are three points that some people believe it may have started from. Here's the point that I believe it is. It's 445 BC. If you've ever read the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2, you know that, that Nehemiah's just got a burden for the city. He goes to Artaxerxes and he says, I, I want to go back. I want to rebuild the entire city. And so he gives him three things. He gives him permission he gives him supplies, and so we know he got the, the you know, cedar from Lebanon. So he gave him permission, he gave him supplies, and he gave him protection to go through. He gave him letters of protection to give him all that he needed to go and do this. And so this was to rebuild the city Jerusalem. And so most likely that is the point that it started. And so the 69 weeks span from the command to re restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Uh, that is, of course, our Lord, our Savior Jesus. Uh, now, some debate as to when this date was. Some people believe it's when the Messiah was born. Uh, other people say, well, it wasn't when he was born, it was when he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And some people are like, well, no, it wasn't until he was crucified, died, and rose again. Um, now, I, I believe that it actually wasn't any of those dates. What I want to submit to you this morning is it was most likely Palm Sunday, April 6th, 32 AD. And here's why. If you read the Gospels, all four of them, and you look at the life of Jesus, there was, again, a very common, very repetitive theme in the life of Jesus. Jesus did not want attention to be on him. Jesus said, shh. Quiet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to heal you. Don't tell anyone. I'm going to change this water into wine. Just, it's not my time yet. And he kept saying, this isn't my time. I'm not there yet. You know, and he would, he would reject it when people would try to hail him as the king, hail him as the Messiah, until one very specific point in time. That's when he purposefully set his disciples out to find the colt of a donkey and to bring it to him that he would ride into the city Jerusalem and everyone threw palm leaves down on the ground. They held him as Christ, as the Messiah, as the King of the Jews. That's the one time where he said, worship me as that. It was very significant in the life of Jesus that he, that for so long repetitively said, don't bring attention to me, and then one time deliberately walked in and was held as Messiah. Uh, and so I believe that that was the time that that took place. And so from Nehemiah chapter 2 all the way through to Palm Sunday, 32 AD. Um, and so seven weeks and 62 weeks gives us our 69 weeks. Uh, seven weeks, so you go seven times seven, that equals 49. Uh, it took 49 years for Jerusalem to be rebuilt. Uh, then you've got the 62 weeks, which brings you up to 69. That's a, an additional 434 years for a total of 483 years from the time that Nehemiah was given the command to rebuild Jerusalem all the way until Palm Sunday. Uh, and from that point, as Jesus goes into the grave, he rises again and sends his spirit and people receive the spirit within him. The church was born. That began a time, a time known as the church age, the time that you and I are now living in. And so that is after the 69 weeks. Um, and so what happened in those 69 weeks, in those 483 years? Uh, that's what we're going to find out as we continue in Daniel chapter 11. And so let's take a look at verse 2. Um, and this is, this is a history lesson. So like I said, buckle your seatbelts. This is a lot of information. Um, the angels there in verse 2 continue to tell Daniel that he will tell him the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength... Through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. 
And when he has risen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. And so what we're going to see in this vision is to Daniel prophetic. Uh, To Daniel, these things have not taken place. But to you and I, the things that we're going to read over these next several verses are historical. They've already happened. So God said it would happen, and it happened. And that should be a source of encouragement for you and I. When God says something's going to happen, we can take it to the bank. Whatever God says in his word is true, it's right, it's real, and we've seen it historically come to fruition over and over and over again. And so in these verses, speaking of a king, this fourth king, uh, who that is is Alexander the Great. Uh, We saw that Alexander the Great was in uh, the image that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2. This image, it was the belly and the thighs of that image. Uh, It was also the leopard with four heads in Daniel chapter 7. And then it was the goat from Daniel chapter 8. Do you see the repetition that's going on here in the Word of God? You've got this vision, you know, this dream in chapter 2, and then you've got chapter 7, and then chapter 8, and then chapter 9, and then chapter 11, and it's going over and over and over and over the same exact things. And every time it's building on itself. Uh, And so God is using this repetition to ingrain it in our mind that when God says something will happen, it will. We have the privilege of seeing that. So this angel goes on in verse 5 saying, Also the king of the south shall become strong as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion, and at the end of some years they shall join forces For the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand. But she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with uh, him who begot her, and with him who strengthened her in those times. And so God spoke this, and then we got the privilege of seeing it. This is speaking of Ptolemy. The first, and a marriage between Antiochus the second and Berenice, who was the daughter of Ptolemy the second. A lot of names. But what you have to understand is God said it would happen, and later on, it happened. It happened in exactly the order that God said it would happen. Notice in verse 7, it says that from a branch of her roots, one shall arise in his place who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north and deal with them and prevail. And verse 18 says, he shall also carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Also, verse 9, the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. However, his sons shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through, and he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. Now, all of this was fulfilled in the person we know historically as Ptolemy III, And then in verses 11 uh, through uh, 16, we see that these battles continue on. Verse uh, 11 says, it says that um, the king of the south shall be moved with rage and in... um, And go out and fight with him and the king of the north who shall muster a uh, great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. When he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up and he he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. For the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment." Now, verse 14 says that in those times, shall me, uh, uh, those times many shall rise up against the king of the south. Also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall 
fall. So the king of the north shall come and build a siege mound and take a fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist. But, verse 16, he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. And so these battles are going on between the north and the south, and there is Israel, this little nation, stuck right in the middle. And so the north will go down, battle with the south. There they are, the south would come up, battle with the north. And they're just kind of caught in the middle of all of this. And uh, it's not good for them the whole time this is going on. Uh, And so verse 17 says that he, that is Antiochus, The third shall also set his face to enter with strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or be for him. And so this is when Antiochus III gave his daughter Cleopatra to Ptolemy V. And so what he was trying to do was gain influence, uh, and he thought, okay, if I give my daughter over, she'll get married, now I'll have this influence there, and he wanted to be able to someday uh, control Egypt, and so he's thinking, this is the best way for me to do this, but his whole plan failed because his daughter wasn't faithful to her husband, Uh, and so that effort failed. And then in verse 18, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall take many. But a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end, and with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. There shall arise, verse 20, in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle." Now, this person who imposed taxes on the glorious kingdom, being Israel, was Seleucus uh, III, who was the eldest son of Antiochus III. And many people believe he was killed by his brother, Antiochus IV, who you may all remember from Daniel chapter 8. When we were teaching through Daniel chapter 8, we talked about Antiochus IV. He was the Antichrist of the Old Testament. And so uh, we, we went through his life in, you know, kind of in some detail when we did Daniel chapter 8, but he was known as the Antichrist of the Old Testament. And this angel goes on to tell him about this man, Antiochus IV. Uh, it says in verse 21 that in his place shall arise a vile person, that vile person being Antiochus IV, um, to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. With the force of a flood, they shall be swept away before, from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. And after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people." He shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his fathers have not done, nor his fathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, the spoil, and riches, and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds, but only for a time. Verse 25 says, He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with the great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, Uh, But he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. Verse 27 says, Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table. But it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant so that he shall do damage and return to his own land. And as we read on, we continue about this vile man, this Antiochus IV, we're going to see that he sets his sights on the holy land. Verse 29 says that that at the appointed time he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. For the ships from Cyprus shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and, and do damage. 
So he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant, and forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, and they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Uh, verse 22 says, Those who do wickedly against the covenant shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now, verse 34, when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. <sighs> that is a whole lot of history. Uh, Daniel's there receiving this as prophecy. This angel saying, this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and then this, and then this, and then this, and he's just going on and on and on. All these things that are going to take place. And here we are in the you know, 2016, we're able to open a history book and go, okay, that happened, and that happened, and that happened, and, th and we're going through all these things that God said would happen that actually happened. And so this vile person that's spoken of here is this foreshadow of the Antichrist that we're going to see in the 70th week. Uh, we did a message on that in chapter 8, like I said, that was on the 3rd of this month called Change of Heart. And so if you were not here and you want to check that out, Go and do that. But notice what's happening here. Notice the repetitiveness in God's Word. Chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 11. What's happening is the information is building. When we first hear about you know, this thing that's going to take place, we hear there's an image. Nebuchadnezzar's given a dream. And in this dream, there's this image, and it's got a head of gold, and then there's metals all the way down that decrease in value but increase in strength. And so as we see this image, we don't know too much about what's happening. And every time we hear more about it, the details begin to build. The details become more and more, and to the point where now we're able to really historically decipher everything that God said would happen. It's very very repetitive. And so what is it that you and I learn from all of this? What we learn is that when God says something, it's true. I can't say that enough. When God says something, it's true. If he says this will happen, it will happen. If he tells you that you can be strong, you can be strong. I'm telling you, God's word is right. That's what we learn from this. It's right. And who doesn't want to hear these things over and over again? I mean, who doesn't want to hear that God loves you? You want to hear that over and over again. It's like me with my son. I can't get tired of it. We should never get tired of hearing God tell us that he loves us. We should never get tired of having God tell us that he has a plan for our lives. We should never get tired of hearing him say, listen, I know you have needs. I already know what they are. I'll take care of them. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be full of anxiety. All you have to do is trust me. I'm full of grace. I'm full of mercy. And he goes over that and over that and over that. He's very, very repetitive. He wants it to sink into our hearts and into our minds to the point where we know it and we understand it and we believe it. That's why God does that. We're learning from this chapter that that 69 weeks, those 69 weeks came and they left. That church age came, and we're living in it now. And guess what? That church age that we're living in is going to be gone someday. That 70th week, it's going to come as well. And someday it'll be over. God's telling us these things, and we know them to be true. And listen, we're living in times of uncertainty. We're living in times where there's wars and rumors of wars. All you have to do is turn on the news for five minutes. And you will see we are living in uncertain times where there are definitely wars going on and rumors of wars. There's so many things out there where like, I don't even know what's happening anymore. There's so much. These people are attacking them. Those people are attacking them. It's like crazy out there. There's wars and rumors of wars. 
We're living in uncertain times with finances. You look at the world financial market, it is insane. You just look at the American stock market, this year was the worst start in the entire history of the stock market. And we've had so many, anybody following this? It is crazy. Would go up 400 points, drop 600 points. I mean, it's, it's just crazy going up and down. Crazy. We're living in times of uncertainty with the church. There's this great apostasy that's taking place. God said it would happen. You look all over the world, you go over to Europe, you go over to England, you see these big church buildings that are empty. One day they were huge churches where God was being worshipped, and today they're, they're just nothing but a tourist trap. People want to go and see where God once was worshipped. People are falling away from the churches left and right. Now, of course, I'm speaking to the choir right now because you're all here. And I thank God for you. I wish there were more. I wish churches couldn't, couldn't hold enough. I mean, it's just crazy the amount of people that have fallen away from God. But God said it would happen. Shouldn't surprise us. But these are uncertain times. Some people are living in personal uncertainty right now. They don't know about their own job. What's going to happen tomorrow? They don't know where their finances are going to come from. They don't know where they're going to live. They don't, they're uncertain about their relationships. There's times of uncertainty. You know, there's another theme in God's Word that's very repetitive. It's that God knows you. He knows your name. He knows the amount of hairs that are on your head, even me. He knows you. He loves you. He has a plan for you. He knows what you need. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be overcome by by anxiety. You can be strong. You can be courageous. Why? Because God said it. You can count on it. When God says something, you can trust it. When God says something, you can take it to the bank. That's what we learn from all this history. I know it's like, oh my gosh, you're going over this stuff. It's this guy, Ptolemy the first, and Ptolemy the fifth, and Antiochus the third killed, you know, killed by Antiochus the fourth, and all these things. And yeah, it can seem overwhelming and all this information, but guess what? It brings us to an understanding that God is right. Amen.